Tim, as always, great job. Appreciate it. And thank you, Suzanne and Tammy and Jody for leading us in worship. Praise the Lord. We appreciate it all. Thank you, all of you, for worshiping the Lord with us, the young people. Great job. Taking over. And that's good. Praise the Lord. God is good. Thank you, John, by the way, for mowing yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> he did a great job on that. That looks nice. So appreciate it very much. Thank the Lord. Amen. We'll let them get downstairs. Thank you, Jesus. There's a lot of disturbing things in the world today, one of which I told Sally yesterday, although she, it went right past her. And I said, uh, one of the most disturbing things for me is to recognize that uh, maybe it isn't premature gray. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, her response was quite similar to yours, so maybe it was the me end of it, praise God. But now I, she, she was giving me a hard time because I ran into this girl. We were, I don't even remember where it was now, but this girl said she recognized me from the vegetarian club. <laughs> and I told Sally, but I've never met her before. Her, be, her before. Her before. We're on a roll now, praise the Lord. You ever had a you ever had one of those days where you just you heard a song and it just won't go away. You you know, it comes over and over and every time you turn you think, where is that coming? It's not even a song that I particularly am fond of, it just won't leave me alone. Well I had one like this and it was just driving me nuts. I finally had to go to the doctor and I said, I can't stop singing the green, green grass of home. He said, That sounds like Tom Jones syndrome. I said, Is that common? And he said, Well, it's not unusual. <laughs> That's only for you old enough to know who Tom Jones was and what songs he sang. Praise the Lord. Okay, well, uh, one more and then I'll we'll move on. But this attorney told his client, he said, I have some good news and I got some bad news. So the accused guy says, uh, well, what's the bad news? And the lawyer says, well, the bad news is your blood's all over the crime scene and the DNA test prove you did it. And so the guy says, well, then what's the good news? He said, your cholesterol is 130. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, God's still in a good mood every day. I mean, who could not be in a good mood on Resurrection Sunday? Praise the Lord. Everything is good, amen, in Jesus. Praise the Lord. And so with that in mind, let's go right to the Word of God. Amen. I know people have uh, family get-togethers and all that today, and we want to be uh, respectful of that. But at the same time, we want to do what this day is all about, and that's lifting up the name of Jesus. Amen. And making him real uh, in our lives. Praise the Lord. So with that in mind, let's start, uh, Peter, if you will. I'd like to start at Isaiah 53 and read verses 4 through 12. Isaiah 53 and verses 4 through 12. Praise the Lord. Don't you love computers? Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his, her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge, shall my righteous servant justify many. For he shall bear their iniquities. Praise the Lord. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, 
and made intercession for the transgressors. Praise the Lord. John chapter 20 and verse 1. There's going to be a, I'm, a little bit different approach to Easter. Uh, it's everywhere in the Bible, you know, and so I, I'm, I'm just not going to preach the typical, you know, tomb thing. But I want to talk to you about how real this all is and how we can identify with that and how life transform, transforming it can be. Yes. Praise the Lord. I'm not saying it makes us perfect people. Obviously, I'd be lying if I told you that, and you would know it because mm -hmm. you're not perfect. Mm -hmm. None of us are perfect. Mm -hmm. He's perfect, yes. and God looks at us through him yes. and declares us perfect, wow. declares us righteous because of his work. Amen. If it were not for the resurrection, we'd still be lost in our sins. We'd still have to figure out some way to try to make this thing work without God. And let me tell you, people have been trying this for about six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 years, and it hasn't worked yet. Praise the Lord. So the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, under the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Uh, verse 11 through 17 now, Peter. So Mary uh, comes to the tomb on resurrection morning. And she stood outside without the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have lain him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Mm -hmm. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, yes. and your God. The first time that could have ever been said in the history of man. Yes. I'm going to my God, yep. and to your God. I'm going to my Father, and your father. He puts us on equal standing yes. with himself the moment, the morning of the resurrection. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. Luke chapter 22, verse 15 through 20. Luke 22, 15 through 20. Praise the Lord. And he said unto him, Unto them, with desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Mm -hmm. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He took the cup, gave thanks, and said, this is, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. He took the bread, gave thanks, and break it, and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 6.18 says it's impossible for God to lie. I love what Don was sharing with, about the, uh, what we call communion or the Last Supper or the Passover. It's, uh, it's a powerful thing to understand and I think we're all getting understanding of this because we, most of us, if we went to church as kids, we were taught this is a fearful thing to be even thinking about taking. You don't want to take communion unless you've got your act together perfectly. Yeah. Well, that's bogus because nobody has their act together perfectly, so nobody would ever take communion. But Jesus is saying, take it. And when you take it, remember what I've done. Remember me. Praise the Lord. So the, book, the, the Bible is a book of covenants. Now, if you're not familiar with covenants, covenants are contracts. They're agreements between God and humanity. Now, you can't get a good lawyer and get out of one of these covenants. That's what the scribes were doing all the time. They were, they were searching through the scripture to find out how this, we're in this covenant here, and this guy's coming along, and he's talking like he's in some other covenant than what we're in, and that can't be. Because God only has one covenant at a time. Amen? So... This, what the Bible really is all about is, is covenants between God and between men. So from the beginning, God set forth this consistent pattern of making covenant with man. I'm just, you know, obviously you realize I'm not being gender specific. It's just mankind is what we're talking about. So it's women, men, everybody. Amen. 
And so he has this, this pattern of making covenants. And God would promise man that he would make a covenant with him. And then secondly, the covenant would be ratified or put into effect through a blood sacrifice. It couldn't be legitimized or, or real until there was bloodshed. Right. Amen. And third, the promised covenant would be physically manifested at some future date. So you got the promise, then you've got the sacrifice, and then somewhere out here is going to be a manifestation of whatever was in that covenant. Yeah. All right? So a lot of the times, a man would have to wait a good while. Amen? God would give him a promise, and it might be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, who knows, before, amen, there would be a blood sacrifice and then the actual covenant fulfilled or manifestation of that covenant. For example, the covenant made with Abram was ratified with a blood sacrifice, right? When he was 75 years old, that happened. Mm -hmm. God gives him a promise. They do the animal thing. They cut the animals. They do the sacrifice. Amen. 75 years old, and yet the covenant wasn't manifested for another 25 years. He had the promise, but no fulfillment. That fulfillment came 25 years later when Isaac was born. Amen? The promised son. So this is what's great about being alive in today, in the present time that we live in. The day of the new covenant. We live in a day where we don't have to wait for God's covenant to be fulfilled. We live in the day of the new covenant by the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. A day that the Holy Spirit has been poured out abundantly, amen, into believers, into the people who accept Christ, who believe that He is their sacrifice, amen, for the promise that God made. Praise God, amen. And so a day that we access the throne of grace, amen. We have a day of forgiveness and remission of sins. That's the day that we live in. That's the lifetime in which we live. Yes. Praise God. Amen. We are living in that day. The day that Almighty God has made it possible by grace to have a personal intimacy with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ, or through the manifestation of God in the flesh. Yeah. Amen. Think of all the godly men and women, just anybody patriarch or anybody you can think of, priests, uh, amen, prophets, all those Amen. Who live their lives hoping to see this day fulfilled and never experiencing it. Living under lesser covenants. Amen. Look, let's read Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40. Hebrews 11, 39 through 40. Now this is at the end of the great faith chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews, where it talks about Abraham believed God. You know, Sarah believed and all these Acting on faith, believing God for yeah. miracles. And God, and, and then the writer of Hebrews says, all of these people trusted the Lord. By faith, they, they closed the, my, the lion's mouth. Some giving their lives rather than succumbing to the forces of uh, evil that were on the planet at the time, a government or whatever it might have been. He goes through all of that. And then at the end of that, he says, and these all having obtained a good report through faith. Received not the promise. They all had a good report because they operated in faith, but they never got the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. That's powerful, church. This is where we are. We have been declared perfect, righteous. That could never happen under any, any covenant that came before, with the exception of Abraham, maybe. Because there was no demand on him within that covenant. And, all, and these all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us that they sh without us should not be made perfect. Uh, go on to verse 12, verses 1 and 2. Or chapter 12, I'm sorry, verses 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about or compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses... Who, what were the ones he was just talking about in 11? Yeah. We're, yeah. They're looking because yeah. they never got the promise. Right. They went through a lot of stuff by faith. They came out the other side, but they never got the promise. We have this great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, which is unbelief, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. Amen. So God made five primary covenants with man. There were a lot of covenants, but there's five major uh, primary covenants with man. And it spanned the time of Noah all the way through Jeremiah. It was the new covenant promised to Jeremiah. He prophesied it. He never experienced it. He was one of these guys. He never saw it. He just prophesied it. He knew it was going to come. He just didn't know when and would he ever be able to be a part of it. So it, 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 it spans the time from uh, Jeremiah, amen, and all the way through from Noah. So it was Jeremiah that promised this new covenant that's being fulfilled in our lives today through the blood of Jesus. So this prophet thousands of years ago spoke of our time. Yes. He never got to see it. But he declared that it would happen, that it had to take place. Amen. So I want to talk a little bit about each of these five primary covenants. <clears throat> and I want you to notice two things. First of all, God's consistent pattern of making covenants with man. That, that's the way God works. That's how he operates. And even in our personal lives with God, even in our personal relationships. And uh, so God, that's, that's the first thing. The promise to make a covenant, then the ratification by blood, and then the physical manifestation of the promise. Okay? So then the second thing, notice the amount of the man, the amount of time that man had to wait for the covenant to be fulfilled or to be manifest. Mm -hmm. All right? So before Noah ever built the ark, God promised to make a covenant with him. Noah waited for the promise to be fulfilled during the years that it took him to build the ark. And they, they, it was 120 years yeah. that he's building this ark. So for 120 years, he's got a promise from God. And he's basically keeping his end of the covenant, which was to build this ark and to obey God. But he didn't see any manifestation. It's not raining. And everybody's laughing at him. Everybody's mocking him. The whole world is saying, what an idiot. You believe in this God, and here you are building a boat. There hasn't been any rain. There is no rain. There's no water anywhere near us, and you're building a boat? Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So for, from the time that God spoke to him to build the ark till the flood ended, amen, he had a promise but no manifestation. It wasn't until after the ark landed on Mount Ararat and Noah offered a blood sacrifice that God ratified the covenant. Amen. The promise is in Genesis, Genesis 6, 18, Peter. Now, I want you to see, God doesn't lie. So you can say, I've got this situation and it's not right. It's not working out and I've got problems. Hey, in this world, you'll have tribulation. You need to be looking to Jesus because he's the author and finisher of your faith. And he's the one who makes you more than an overcomer. He said, in the world, you'll have problems, you'll have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I have overcome yes. the problem, whatever it might be. It may not look like it, but hang in there. There's a promise. And if you'll believe the promise, it has to come to pass. That's what Tim was talking about. You've got to trust God. You've got to believe God. You can't just trust Him today and then just ignore it and just look at your problem for the next six months and think that something good's going to happen. Right. Amen? He's already done everything He's going to do. It's a question of us believing it to see it yes. manifest. Yes. So, but with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. Praise the Lord. The sealing with the blood, Genesis 8, verse 20. That's the promise. That's, that's the original promise that God makes. And then they seal it with blood. Noah built an altar unto the Lord, took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So that's the shedding of the blood. Yep. All right. Then the promise becomes manifested in chapter 8, verse 21. Next verse. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. That's the promise. I'm not ever going to do this again. Amen. Genesis 9, verse 11.
And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. Verse uh, 13. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. Every time you see a rainbow, it's a continuation of God's promise to Noah and to all of the earth. Praise the Lord. All right. Then there was Abram. Abram becomes Abraham. But when God entered into agreement with him, he was Abram. God promised Abram that he would become a great nation and that his descendants would outnumber the stars. The promises made to Abram became a basis for every other covenant that would be made. Amen. After God gave Abram the promise, after he made covenant with him, amen, the covenant was ratified by a blood sacrifice. After the blood sacrifice, Abraham patiently waited for 25 years, we mentioned earlier, until the covenant was manifested through the birth of Abraham's son, Isaac. That was the promise, amen, that he would... His offspring would be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. They would be more than he could number. Although his wife was, was uh, unable to bear children and had been all of her life. They had no children. They're 75 years old. Now God's telling them, no, but you're still going to have one. And it will be, into, you know. So Hebrews 6 verse 15. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. God doesn't lie. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 6, 12, if you can back up there a couple. Hebrews 6 and 12. And ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith and patience. Believing and believing and believing. Praise the Lord. Whether you see it or don't see it. I do. I, I understand the frustration that people go through, but I, you can say, I don't know what I'm talking about, but God is not a liar. Right. So somebody's missing something, right. praise the Lord, yeah. and it's not God. It's not His promise. It's not His right. ability to make that promise come to pass. So the promise for Him was in, Gen- in uh, uh, Genesis 12 and verse 2, Peter. Promise is that he's going to have offspring. He's going to, he's going to be uh, the father of a great nation. I'll make of thee a great nation, and I'll bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Amen. That's the promise he made, all right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, chapter 15, uh, we'll, we'll just skip that, but we already know what it's talking about. Let's go to the sealing of the covenant at Genesis 15, verses 9 and 10. And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took them all of these and divided them in the midst and laid each piece one against another. But the birds divided he not. Praise the Lord. So that's the sealing of the blood. There's a sacrifice. He's killed all these animals, right? Genesis 15 and verse uh, 9. That's where we are. I'm sorry. Genesis 15 verse 17. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So that was the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, it's called, that went through between these divided animals. That's how the covenant was made. Amen. And so only God passed through or between these pieces of uh, flesh. Abram wasn't required to pass through. Meaning that God himself would be solely responsible for the fulfillment of this covenant. Abraham didn't take part in anything other than the killing of the animals. It was God that walked through them to show he was abiding, going to abide by this covenant. Amen. And so Abraham didn't have to do anything. The covenant was going to be fulfilled by God. Amen. In other words, Abram's covenant was an unconditional covenant. It wasn't based on what he did. It was only based on what God did. All he had to do was say, yes. Yes. Right? Amen. So it wasn't dependent on anything from Abraham. And the promise manifested in Genesis 21, verses 2 through 5. 
Sarah conceived and bare Abram a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Twenty-five years from the time that God initially gave him the promise. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So Moses, the next one. After the children of Israel had gone out of Egypt, the, the original Passover, the, the first Passover, amen, they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Moses goes up Mount Sinai and God promises to make a covenant with the people on one condition. Amen. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. Now therefore, if you'll obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Praise the Lord. All right, this was the first conditional covenant God made with man. It was conditioned on man's behavior, on man's doing what God had said. Obedience. Amen. All right, Exodus 24, verse 3. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments, and all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. Probably not a wise answer, but that's what they said. Praise the Lord. Yeah, we can do it all. At that point, the covenant is ratified with a blood sacrifice. Amen. And then God tells Moses to make him a sanctuary that God would dwell among them, setting them apart as a special treasure, the kings and priests of this kingdom. Amen. God's dwelling place. All right. The promise is in... Uh, Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. We won't go back to that. That's where he said, I want to be with you. The sealing was of the blood or the, the sacrament was done in look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. Okay, so there's the, sac there's the, the sealing with the blood. Then the promise is manifested in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. Praise the Lord. I let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. That's the fulfillment. He said, I'm going to be with them. They're going to be my special people, and I'm going to dwell among them. So he's telling them, here's the, here's the fulfillment of that. And they build the tabernacle and then, of course, eventually the temple. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you getting the point here? When God says he's going to do something, he does it. And he does it the same way every time. He makes a promise, then there's a... There's a sacrificial letting of blood, amen, and then the fulfillment comes as a result of that. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Every single time. I'm giving you like five different ones, but there's many others in the Bible. Yeah. That's how God operates, and He's never broke one of these. Yeah. He's never lied. He's never made a commitment to somebody and then never followed up on it. Praise the Lord. Yes. David, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. Now, interestingly, David is about the biggest screw-up in the Bible. Yes, and that's, that's saying a lot. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And God comes to him and says, hey, I want to make a, I want to make a covenant with you. Yeah. And you can say, well, my life has been all screwed up, or I've done this, or I haven't done that. Look, God is, God is saying the same thing to you. David was an adulterer. David was a murderer. David lied. He, he went back on his word to God and numbered the people after he was told not to. There are multiple over and over things that he had done that were absolutely in the flying in the face of what God had wanted. And yet God still loved him. Why? Because David believed God was merciful. He believed in the grace of God. He believed in the forgiveness of God. And God makes a covenant with him. If you can believe God... You're nearly home. Yes. Praise the Lord. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Praise the Lord. Interestingly, immediately after God gave David this promise, instead of offering a blood sacrifice, 
David begins to praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for remembering me. Thank you, Lord, that forever someone from my genealogy is going to be seated on this throne. Praise the Lord forever. And so he just gives praise and thanksgiving to God. The promise from God to make covenant with David wasn't sealed with blood until Jesus died on the cross. Thousands of years later. And that's why they go, run around and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. They, they knew the prophecy. They knew the, 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 the commitment, amen, that God had to establish that throne forever. Yes. Amen. And so the promise from God to make covenant with David is sealed with the blood of Jesus. Amen. Yes. Its fulfillment comes when Christ was raised from the dead and was seated at the right hand of God forever. Amen. Amen. And we are seated with him in heavenly places because we are his body. We are a part of that resurrection. You were crucified with Christ. You were, if you have accepted Christ as your Savior or whenever you do, you in the mind of God, in reality, in the truth, were crucified with Christ. And you were raised with him in newness of life. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. So promise come Samuel 7, 12, and 13, which we already read. We won't have to go back over that. But God says, I'm going to make sure we're going to, I'm going to have this covenant with you. And your seed will forever set on the throne. Praise the Lord. And so the promise is manifested. We know it's sealed by the blood of Jesus. And the promise is manifested in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20. which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, Paul says. Look at Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Yes. Praise the Lord. With his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Yes. Praise the Lord. That was the covenant that was made with Jeremiah. The covenant promise became the new covenant given to each of us who believe and partake of the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes. Look at Jeremiah 31. <clears throat> Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34. I know I, this is being redundant, but sometimes I think we just need to be told over and over and over because we let life start telling us what is real and what is reality instead of Him. Praise the Lord, because we get bombarded by issues, yeah. sickness, death, uh, yes. you know, poverty, financial issues, all of these things, all the, you know, the turmoil in relationships and everything else. And we, for, we lose track of the sight of what God has promised us, what is ours by inheritance, what is ours because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. It's ours. It belongs to us. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Praise the Lord. Yes. Hebrews, uh, now let me see. Let's, let's just, let me just go from there. So the, this, the new covenant promises three things. God promised a new covenant, amen, that would give a supernatural covenant internal empowering of God's grace written on our hearts and minds so that we could keep His commandments in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's the first part. The second, He promised to give us the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us and bring us into intimate personal relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The third, He promised in the New Covenant that it would pr He would provide remission or pardon yes. of sin, thereby cleansing us of an evil conscience. Yes. Now, that's great news, right? Yes. But I can tell you from personal experience, amen, there are people that are trying to do this by keeping the yes. commandments themselves. They are. They are. 
That's a roadmap for failure, praise the Lord. Also, he promised to give us the indwelling Holy Spirit to teach us and bring us into intimate personal relationship with him. But vast numbers of Christians never listen to the voice of God. They only listen to their circumstance. They only look at what they can see with their natural eyes instead of looking in the spirit or listening to the voice of God from within. Because I can promise you this, it will usually contradict whatever your circumstance is. I mean, if it's easy to do, it's not God. Because God's not wanting you to do it. He's wanting you to trust in Him to do it. But if you're not listening for the Spirit, if you're not listening to the Spirit... If you're just listening to the circumstances and the people around you, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. This has to be by faith. It's the only way it works. Yeah. Jesus did all the work. We just have to believe it. Yes. We have to act on that belief. Yes. Praise the Lord. So, so amen. Number three, he promised in the new covenant he would provide pr- remission. He would provide yes. he forgiveness, remission of sins. Yes. Amen. Do we do Hebrews 9.12? All right, let's do it. Praise the Lord. Neither by the blood of boats, bulls, and goats, only blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 23. Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. Praise God. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world, but also in the world that is to come. Praise the Lord. So the new covenant was manifested on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out. Praise the Lord. It was poured out based on the promise of Jeremiah 31, which we already read, 33 and 34. He was going to make a, a people who would be led by the Spirit and so forth rather than by their... Uh, legal uh, binding, amen, contracts. But the sealing of the blood was in Hebrews 9 and 12 and, and Ephesians 1, uh, 20, which we just read. And the promise is manifested in Acts chapter 2, 4 through uh, 41, where we know that the Spirit was poured out and they all received the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidenced by speaking in other tongues. It was made available to everybody and has been ongoing from that day, from that day since. Praise the Lord. So while the patriarchs... Uh, uh, Unlike them, we don't have to wait. We don't have to wait for something, amen, of this uh, covenant to be fulfilled in our lives. It's already fulfilled. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 3, 16 through 18. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. He's talking about... The Jews always going back to the law instead of entering into the new covenant. They weren't getting the benefit of the covenant unless they accepted Christ. So they were still trying to do things by the book, by the law, rather than by Christ himself. Uh, Chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, Peter. Still 2 Corinthians, chapter 4, 16 through 18. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen, praise the Lord, are eternal. Glory to God. Unlike the patriarchs, we're not waiting, amen, for the promised new covenant to be fulfilled. It was fulfilled, amen, in Christ. Praise God. We are living in the time of a new covenant fulfillment made by the blood of Jesus Christ right now. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 22, verses 15 through 20. Luke 22, 15 through 20. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Jesus is having the Last Supper. He's having communion. Yep. Mm-hmm. And he's pointing to the new covenant that's to come. Yep. It's not there yet. Now he says, I'll, I won't do this again until the new kingdom. And I've heard a lot of people say, Jesus is in heaven, but he's not going to drink any wine or anything again until the, the uh, marriage supper of the bride. That's not true. He says, I'm not doing this until the kingdom comes. The kingdom has come. Yes. He said, the kingdom is near you, and it shall be 
in you. When it came in us, Jesus, I guarantee you, they lifted a glass, amen, in heaven, and wine was drank. They had a party. They had a celebration. All these people, amen, who had been this great cloud of witnesses, I guarantee you, they were all lifting the cup, hallelujah, and drink and eating the, the, the body, praise the Lord, because that thing had been fulfilled, the thing they had waited for for thousands and thousands of years, the ultimate perfect covenant, amen, that they all sought after but could never attain. Praise the Lord. It's ours. Yes. Praise God. Praise Amen. God. The Last Supper. It's symbolic of the phasing out of the Old Covenant and establishing of the New Covenant promised yes. by Jeremiah 700 years earlier. Yes. That's what Jesus is talking about here. So Jesus' body was given as the perfect sacrifice and His blood which was poured out on the cross yes. was perfect blood. And that's the way of the New Covenant. In other words, the New Covenant was to be an internal intimacy with Christ by receiving His flesh and His blood. Yes. Exactly my understanding of what Don was saying earlier. Yes. Thank you, We're not just... You know, the Catholics have the, yeah. the expression transubstantiation, which means they believe it literally turns into the body and the blood of Jesus. Well, the truth is, he says as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Mm -hmm. It's symbolism. Mm -hmm. But it's a reality at the same time. Yeah. Because if your faith is operating right. in what Jesus has said, you're being renewed. Yes. You're being healed. Yes. You're being delivered. You're yes. being set free. Your financial situation yes. can be turned around by yes. taking communion. Yes. Because it's a reminder to this what this already knows. Yes. And that is He has finished it. It is finished. Yes. It's just a question of me receiving it by faith. Yes. Amen. To experience it. Jesus. Every part of the new covenant it works that way. Yes. You believe. Yes. You, can't, you cannot just come up with excuses. No. You can. Yes. But you're only hurting yourself. Right. Praise the Lord. You know, the, law, the, the Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ. Yes. First comes grace, then comes truth. Praise God. Hebrews 4, verse 9 through 12. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Praise the Lord. The rest is, it's finished. What his death, burial, and resurrection provided is rest. It's no longer about us. It's about believing Him. It's about believing the finished work of the cross. Praise the Lord. It's through entering that rest that we know and experience the natural, supernatural flow of the Holy Spirit. That's how you experience it in your life. You won't get it by being all anxious and freaked out. I promise you. Because that's not faith. That's unbelief. That's doubt. The rest is where we just come in and say, that's said, that settles. You said it, it's done. I've read five, and every one of them, he, whatever he said, he did. Now, you can think yourself special, but that's about the height of egotism, amen, and self-centeredness. You're not special. He's special. You're just another believer, amen, who has access to everything that God wants you to experience. Praise the Lord. People say, well, I, you know, I'm, 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 I'm self-conscious. No, you're self-centered. <laughs> this isn't Psych 101, but I'm just saying it's all about you. You can be the biggest blowhard and braggart, or you can be the, the most, you know, shrinking violet. It's the same thing. It's about you instead of about him. 
And as long as it's about you, he has problems getting what you want. Praise the Lord. It's just that way. Hebrews chapter 9. And I'm going to read lengthy here because we're about to finish up. Hebrews chapter 9. I want to read verses 8 through 28. And let's, for crying out loud, let's read this like we believe it. And then let's do what we would do with anything else that we had information about that was true. We would act on that truth. Praise the Lord. We'd go get a lawyer and we'd say, bless God, you're going to keep this contract because you signed it. I didn't put a gun to your head. There was no intimidation here. You entered into this agreement. You entered into this contract and you're not getting out of it because I'm depending on this contract that you signed. That's what we would do. We don't have to do that with God. Because God won't lie and he won't renege on the, on the contract. Whatever he said, that's what it's going to be. So the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. In other words, when the original temple was still standing, the only way to get to God was through that veil, through the high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement. Yeah. But once that was done away, once Jesus came, the ultimate uh, reality of, of a tabernacle or the temple, which we are now temples of the Holy Ghost because we are one with Him. Amen. That, it was impossible to get to God. That way, while that first tabernacle was standing, because only one person could get in there a year, and that was the high priest, right. which was a figure for the time then present. Yeah. It was a picture at that time for something that was going to come, yeah. in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. That's what they did in the temple. That's what the whole business was about. That could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So that you could offer all the sacrifices you wanted, but you knew deep down in your mind you were still a screw-up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So your conscience was never clear. Right. Amen. It's through the, this entering into his rest that we're talking about. Praise the Lord. Keep going. Praise the Lord. Okay. There you go. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hand, that is to say, not of this building. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh... How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, the new covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament or the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of a necessity be the death of the testator. So whenever there was a covenant, something had to die for that to be validated. It was bulls and goats and pigeons and whatever. Here, it's Jesus himself. It's God, man. It's God in the flesh. Praise the Lord. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon, neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For the Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year, amen, with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the world, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. 
So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Praise the Lord. Now here's the deal. When Jesus rose from the dead, he said, don't touch me yet. I have to ascend to my Father, your Father, my God, your God. Because what did he say he had to do? He had to go up and sprinkle blood upon all of the utensils, uh, upon the tabernacle itself. Now let me ask you this question. What does he say to us? The moment you're born again, you know you not, you are the temple of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. And within each one of us are these giftings or these utensils that we use, amen, for God. So what Jesus was doing was he was yes. sprinkling us with his blood. Yes. So that the moment, because all of this is before the foundation of the world anyway, and all of our sins were future when he did this. And so he's saying, because I know the end from the beginning, I know who's in the end. I'm not telling you. I'm just saying I know who will and who won't because I know the end from the beginning. And so you have been sprinkled with the pure blood of Almighty God. Amen. You have been sanctified. Amen. Set apart. Amen. For the purpose of God in this world. For God to have access into this planet. For God to show himself mighty on your behalf. And the moment we start talking about, well, I don't know if God can do this or God has it. Well, will he, will he do? Listen, stop yes. and go back and read the word of God and operate yes. from that reality and from that truth. Yes. Quit looking for excuses. God doesn't make excuses. He no. makes promises yes. and all he can do is keep them. Yes. He cannot lie. He's not a man. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All right, a couple more scriptures here and we'll wrap up. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, spiritually speaking, we're perfect. And so we can look at that and say, well, yeah, that's great when I get to heaven or as long as I'm operating in the spirit. But just to clarify that, look at 2 Peter 1, verses 2 through 4. I'm talking about what happens to us as a result of this covenant. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things, that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. All things. Yes, all things. Yes. There's not some other thing than all things. Amen. And according to that, he has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, you can, you can act like you don't. Uh, uh, it's not working for me. You can be, feel like I'm something, something special because my life is all screwed up. Or you can believe what he says. Because every one of us goes through this stuff. You're not special. You're human. What makes you special is the faith in what Christ has done for us. That's what makes us special. That's what sets us apart from the norm. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. How are we going to partake? Well, remembering the promised sacrifice or the promises and then the sacrifice. Okay, find a promise in here. By his stripes you're healed. That's part of your covenant. You want to know if that's a real promise from God or not? Then you look for a sacrifice somewhere that will validate that. Isaiah 53 tells us exactly what God wants to do, what his intention is, and yep. Jesus did exactly that. He did. Whatever that need is, just look to the cross. Yes. Because your sacrifice was shed right there. The blood was spilled there, ratifying yes. positively the covenant for you yes. personally. Yes. Every time we go and we take communion, that's what it is we're doing. We're looking to the cross for the promise. I need healing in my body. Yes. I'm taking communion today. Yes. I'm taking the blood 
and the body of Christ, I'm going to think back. That, that's a promise. He told me by His stripes I'm healed. Amen. And now I'm looking at that sacrifice. I'm saying that blood is shed. I'm taking it in. Amen. And by His stripes I am healed. I already have been healed. It's true of finances. It's true of anything and everything. That's the reason for the Passover meal. That's the reason for the covenant. And the reason for the shedding of blood is to prove God faithful to His covenant. Now how faithful can it be beyond God Himself coming as a man and then giving that life? Sacrificing it to keep His word. That's what it was. He had to do it in order to keep His word from 700 years ago. That's how voracious God is. That's how His veracity is unchallenged. If He said it, it's the truth. If it wasn't the truth before He said it, it is now. Praise the Lord. So when you take the cup, you take the bread. You believe that Jesus took bread and broke it, He said. Because his body was going to be broken. That's what he told his disciples. Yes. I'm doing this to show you. To give you access. To all of these promises. So you'll understand. Because they had, a, they had an understanding of animal sacrifice. They had an understanding of the shedding of blood for covenants. They were Jews. So he's using that same analogy. That same metaphor for them to understand. This is how it works. As you take of His broken body. Know that His body was broken so that yours can be whole. Yes. He, didn't just, he didn't just suffer that for the sake of suffering. It's just so He could say, wow, I really went through a lot. No, He did it to provide for you. Not only forgiveness of sin. Right. Redemption from sin. But healing. Prosperity. Yes. Deliverance. Whatever the need might be. When you take it in the spirit of faith, something happens in your body. You say, well, it's all, it's all just metaphorical. No, it isn't. It is, but it isn't. Something happens. You become strong. You become healthy. And you live long. If you could believe. See, it wouldn't do any good for somebody to bring a, a lamb to the high priest if he didn't believe right. that he had need of forgiveness right. or healing or deliverance. It would have been idiotic. Mm -hmm. You bring the lamb, and they never look at the guy with the sin. Right. They look at the lamb. If the lamb's good, you're good. Yep. Well, Jesus is perfect. Is perfect. So you're perfect. Yes. So God isn't going to hold, withhold anything from you. He did everything He could for you to have everything. He, he, he said if, if, uh, if God wants to give you these things, how much more will He give you by the blood of Jesus? Yeah. If it's God's desire to do it for you anymore, how much more will He do yeah. having based this, on, this promise on the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus? Right. Praise God. So by now it ought to be clear that the blood and the body have two different applications. In Isaiah 53, he says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Praise the Lord. He didn't just bear our sin. But bodily weakness. Emotional issues. Sickness. Pain. Poverty. Amen. Yeah. He went through every bit of it so that you don't have to. That's right. Praise the Lord. Toby, could I get you and uh, Don to pass out the uh, elements here and we'll take communion quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Remember, this is the true Passover. Yep. 
Everything else was pointing to the reality. But remember this. When Israel came out of the original Passover, what happened? None laid. No sick among them. Everybody wealthy. The people couldn't give them enough gold and silver and jewels when they left. They left wealthy. They left rich as a result of the Passover. And the same goes for you. That's a type. This is the reality. That's what that blood purchased for them. It purchased freedom from slavery. It purchased freedom from bondage. It purchased prosperity where they had been slaves. They became rich. They had been weak. They went out strong. No feeble among them. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's a double cure. And it's evident in the original Passover. And the resurrection is the true Passover. Luke 22, 15 through 20. The true Passover, praise the Lord. Well, I'll just read it to you. And he said unto them, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's us, that's here. Praise the Lord. He took the cup, gave thanks, and said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. It has come, church. Yes, it has. How do I know he's taking it? Because I'm taking it. That's right. Praise the Lord. Remember the old saying, lips that touch liquor will never touch mine? <laughs> well, Jesus gave me a big kiss. Yes. And I smelled wine on his breath. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Every time we take it, He's taking it. That's what he was talking about. I won't take from the fruit of the vine again until the kingdom comes. Well, the kingdom has come and it is in you. And every time we take it, Jesus takes it with us. He's reestablishing the very promises that he made to his disciples and that God the Father made from the book of Genesis all the way through. Praise the Lord. Took the cup, gave thanks, and said, This is it. Take, divide it amongst yourselves. I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. Praise the Lord. Verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Yes. Amen. This do in remembrance of me or in acknowledging of what is yours because of me. So whatever is in your body today that you don't want, right. or whatever's not in your body today that you do want. Yes. Amen? Any physical thing, he gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Whatever that might be, if you can believe today in the Word of God and the, and the very promise of God himself, yes. then whatever that need is, you can receive it right now in Jesus' yes. name. This is his body. Yes. We're ingesting mm -hmm. the resurrected Christ. We're taking God in. Yes. And I may tell you this. God has never had a cold. No. Never had heart trouble. He never has. Huh? He's never had diabetes. Nothing. He's never had the flu. He's never had anything but pristine, perfect right. health. That's his desire for us. <coughs> Praise the Lord. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. This ought to just 
it ought to just erase any consciousness of sin in your right. mind. Any guilt, any shame. This is the eraser. It's resurrection day. Amen. We need to be walking like new creatures. In Healed, whole, prospered. I don't care if you have to do this a dozen times a day. He said, do it whenever you The disciples went from house to house doing this. So they might have done it 20 times a day. So there isn't a rule about how often we do it. He's just saying whenever you do it, and as often as you do it, do it knowing that this is a, this is a breakthrough for you every time you can receive it. There's healing, there's deliverance, there's prosperity, there's breakthroughs in all kinds of areas. If you'll just say yay and amen just the way Jesus did. Well, all the promises of God in Him are yay and amen in Him. We just took in the promise. That binds together every promise. Thank you, God. It's ours. You are what you eat. Yep. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So when Jesus rose from the dead, He not only took our punishment on the cross, He didn't just bring us forgiveness. He also brought us healing, deliverance, prosperity, hope yes. for a future. Yes. This is the new covenant, church. Yes. You have perfect standing before God. His ears are attentive to you. He hears your cry. He responds. Praise the Lord. Happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Let's live every day as though it's Resurrection Day because it truly is. He's alive in every one of us. And every time another person receives Christ, there's another resurrection. Yes. Hallelujah. There's another proof yes. of that resurrection never ending. Yes. But having eternal impact yeah. on all of humanity. A new heaven and a new earth. Praise the Lord. And a new creation Hallelujah. to full. Hallelujah. Praise God. He's yes. a good God. Amen. He cannot lie. Yes. No matter what the enemy tries to tell you. Yes. When you find a promise... You stand on that promise. Tell the enemy he's the liar. Amen. This is what God said and he will flee. Praise the Lord. God didn't save us to suffer and squirm like, you know, like unsaved people without hope in the world. That's where we were before we were saved. Lost without God, without hope. That's no longer our identity. We are a temple of the living God. With a kingdom wanting to be manifest from us. Yes. And by faith we'll do that. Yes. Amen. Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. Yes. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your patience. I know it was a little bit kind of convoluted. But uh, amen. I think sometimes we just need to be reminded of some simple things that we just overlook. You know, we want the... Stupendous rather than the supernatural. He's got something supernatural in us that is so supernatural we can't even, can't even comprehend it ourselves. All we got to do is believe it and let it go. Amen. Have a great resurrection day. Amen. Let's make everyone another resurrection day. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great day.